Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Andy Linehan, president of the City Club of Portland. Welcome to our holiday feature, uh, our holiday program featuring uh, Steve Wilkerson from Portland Center Stage and the Top Deck Barbershop Quartet. It may be our holiday program, but I can't let go without making just a few announcements. Uh, I'll let you know, of course, that there will be no Friday forums over the next two Fridays, and enjoy your holiday. Uh, Friday forums will begin again on January 9th with the fifth installment of our Keeping Oregon's Promise series, and this time it will focus on uh, financing public services. For that forum, we'll be back at the MAC, Multnomah Athletic Club. Then on January 12th, which is a Monday, City Club will present a forum on Ballot Measure 30, the tax referral package, at the Multnomah County Commissioner's Building, which is at the east end of the Multnomah of the uh, Hawthorne Bridge. That will be at uh, 5 to 6.30. The forum will feature a moderated discussion from a four-person panel and a question and answer period. Uh, for more information, contact the club. We're also proud to announce the launch of our new website. It's still at www.pdxcityclub.org but it now features a number of great new additions, such as the ability to uh, pay online for Friday forums and to join the club online. Uh, the site, the website redesign was supported by a contribution from Shields Oblitz Johnson and was created by Stevie and Milius. And, uh, and then the uh, uh, website work, where some of the website work was done by Studio Ridge LLC. And web hosting is provided by TDR Technologies. All of that means a lot to those in the know in the, in the uh, high tech field. So take a look at the new site. It's very attractive, and it's going to be very useful as well. The annual fund drive continues. We're not over yet. Now you can contribute online as well as in person. Uh, 288 City Club members and friends have contributed already. So join them in supporting City Club. There are envelopes on your table. What, what better way to celebrate the holidays in the year? And don't, don't just stop with a gift to City Club. There are still all your families and friends. Uh, don't be caught at the last minute looking for that perfect gift. Give a City Club membership and bring the, the gift of year-round civic engagement and intellectual stimulation. Uh, we have a sad note today. Nikki Clark, who's been our communications director, is leaving us to go back to Washington, D.C. via home, her home in Louisiana. We'll miss her greatly. She's been wonderful in the last years. Nikki, where are you? In the far back of the room? We'd give a little applause to Nikki. And we want to welcome uh, Tim Krause, who's joining us as our new communications director. And Tim, if you're back there, why don't you stand up too? Welcome, Tim. Broadcasts of uh, City Club programs this quarter are made po possible in part by corporate underwriting from Pacificor, CH2M Hill, and Schwabe, Williamson, and Wyatt. We're very grateful for their support. As we were pondering topics for today's program, we considered presenting a very cogent analysis of community policing with special emphasis on the challenging choices faced by the city and county councils as they address public service budgets. Others on the program committee uh, argued that the times call for the club to highlight the year in tax reform and to recap the state's end of the year fiscal status. I thought I might be able to add to that a very succinct analysis of the club's own financial situation, ending with a compelling case for a supplemental, supplemental end of the year donation from each of you. However, there was a well-organized well faction of the program committee that held out for a comprehensive end of the year economic diagnosis with a special focus on potential Federal Reserve Board actions that could affect interest rates next year. After a tug of war among various program committee factions representing different public poli policy agenda, Somebody came up with a radical idea. Let's leave the bah humbug to Scrooge. We've had enough of Grinches on our podium this year. We, did, we don't need public policy for our end of the year event. We need a little theater and music. So here we are, deprived of our regular public policy fix for one day out of our city club year. And when, what better reason to do that than to enjoy Steve Wilkerson presenting excerpts from Truman Capote's Christmas Memories. As a longtime subscriber to Portland Center Stage, I can personally attest that Steve Wilkerson is one of Portland's quirkiest and funniest actors. This is the second year that Steve Wilkerson has appeared in Santa Land Diaries and Christmas Memory. Another P among other PCS uh, credits, he's been involved with uh, most recently Outrage, and in past years, Much Ado About Nothing, The Devils, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, and he played Mr. Bungie in A New Brain, for which he won a Drammy Award. 
We're very grateful to Portland Center Stage and Steve for sparing us the forum talk topics I mentioned to you earlier. So welcome, Steve. Good afternoon. As the kind gentleman said, I am appearing at Portland Center Stage doing uh, Truman, uh, Truman Capote's A Christmas Memory and David Sedaris' Santa Land Diaries. I decided today to give you a little bit of A Christmas Memory by Truman Capote. He published this in 1956, and it's loosely autobiographical, but autobiographical about his growing up with three distant, unmarried lady relatives in the South. And I'll start at the beginning, but I'll end well short of the middle, so I encourage you, if you don't get out to see it, to at least read the book. It's a short novella or a long short story. Imagine a morning in late November, a coming of winter morning more than 20 years ago. Consider the kitchen of a spreading old house in a country town. A great black stove is its main feature. But there is also a big round table and a fireplace with two rocking chairs placed in front of it. Just today, the fireplace commenced its seasonal roar. A woman with shorn white hair is standing at the kitchen window. She's wearing tennis shoes and a shapeless gray sweater over a summery calico dress. She's small and sprightly like a bantam hen, but due to a long youthful illness, her shoulders are pitifully hunched. Her face is remarkable, not unlike Lincoln's, craggy like that and tinted by sun and wind, but it is delicate too, finely boned, and her eyes are sherry colored and timid. Oh, my, she exclaims, her breath smoke in the window pane. It's fruitcake weather. The person to whom she is speaking is myself. I am seven. She is 60-something. We're cousins, very distant ones, and we have lived together for, well, as long as I can remember. Other people inhabit the house, relatives, and though they have power over us and frequently make us cry, we are not, on the whole, too much aware of them. We are each other's best friend. She calls me Buddy in memory of a boy who was formerly her best friend. The other Buddy died in the 1880s when she is still a child. She is still a child. I knew it before I got out of bed, she says, turning away from the window with a purposeful excitement in her eyes. The courthouse bell sounded so cold and clear, and there were no birds singing. They've all gone to warmer country, yes, indeed. Oh, buddy, stop stuffing biscuit and fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. We've 30 cakes to bake. It's always the same. A morning arrives in November, and my friend, as though officially inaugurating the Christmas time of year, that exhilarates her imagination and fuels the blaze of her heart, announces, It's fruitcake weather. Fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. The hat is found. A straw cartwheel corsaged with velvet roses. Out of doors, it is faded. It once belonged to a more fashionable relative. Together, we guide our buggy, or dilapidated baby carriage, out to the garden and into a grove of pecan trees. The buggy is mine, that it, it was bought for me when I was born. It is made of wicker, rather unraveled, and the wheels wobble like a drunkard's legs. But it is a faithful object. Spring times, we take it to the woods, fill it with flowers, herbs, wild ferns for our porch pots. In the summertime, we pile it with picnic paraphernalia and sugarcane fishing poles and roll it down to the edge of a creek. It has its winter uses, too, as a truck for hauling firewood from the yard to the kitchen. 
as a warm bed for Queenie, our tough little orange and white rat terrier who has survived distemper and two rattlesnake bites. Queenie is trotting beside it now. Three hours later, we are back in the kitchen hauling a heaping buggy load of windfall pecans. Our backs hurt from gathering them. How hard they were to find among the concealing leaves, the frosted deceiving grass. The main crop having been shaken off the trees and sold by the orchard's owners, who are not us. Crackle. A cheery crunch. Scraps of miniature thunder sound as the shells collapse and the golden mound of sweet, oily, ivory meat mounts in the milk glass bowl. Queenie begs to taste, and now and again my friend sneaks her a mite, though insisting we deprive ourselves. Oh, we mustn't, buddy. If we start, we won't stop. And there's scarcely enough as there is for 30 cakes. The kitchen is growing dark. Dusk turns the window into a mirror. Our reflections mingle with the rising moon as we work by the fireside in the firelight. At last, when the moon is quite high, we toss the final hull onto the fire and with joined sighs watch it catch flame. The buggy is empty, the bowl is brim full. We eat our supper, cold biscuits, bacon, blackberry jam, and discuss tomorrow. Tomorrow, the kind of work I like best begins. Buying cherries and citra, ginger and vanilla and canned Hawaiian pineapple, rinds and raisins and walnuts and whiskey and oh, so much flour, butter, so many eggs, spices, flavorings, why, we'll need a pony to pull the buggy home. But before these purchases can be made, there is the question of money. Neither of us has any. Except for skinflint sums persons in house occasionally provide. A dime is considered very big money. Or what we earn ourselves through various activities. Holding rummage sales selling buckets of hand-picked blackberries and jars of homemade jams and apple jelly and peach preserves, rounding up flowers for funerals and weddings. Once, we won 79th prize, $5, in a national football contest. Not that we know a full thing about football. We just enter any contest we hear about. At the moment, our hopes are centered on the $50,000 grand prize being offered to name a new brand of coffee. We suggested AM. And after some hesitation, for my friend thought it perhaps sacrilegious, the slogan, AM, Amen. To tell the truth, our only really profitable enterprise was the fun and freak museum we conducted in a backyard woodshed two summers ago. The fun was a stereopticon with slide views of Washington and New York lent us by a relative who had been to those places. She was furious when she discovered why we'd borrowed it. The freak was a three-legged bitty chicken hatched by one of our own hens. Everybody hereabouts wanted to see that bitty. We charged grown-ups a nickel, kids two cents, and took in a good $20 before the museum shut down due to the decease of the main attraction. But one way and another, we do each year accumulate Christmas savings, a fruitcake fund. These monies we keep hidden in an ancient bead purse, under a loose board, under the floor, under a chamber pot, under my friend's bed. The purse is seldom removed from this safe location except to make a deposit, or, as happens every Saturday, a withdrawal. For on Saturdays, I am allowed 10 cents to go to the picture show. My friend has never been to a picture show, nor does she intend to. I'd rather hear you tell the story, buddy. That way I can imagine it more. 
Besides, a person my age shouldn't squander their eyes when the Lord comes. Let me see him clear. In addition to never having seen a movie, my friend has never eaten in a restaurant, traveled more than five miles from home, received or sent a telegram, read anything except funny papers in the Bible, worn cosmetics, cursed, wished someone harm, told a lie on purpose, let a hungry dog go hungry. Here are a few things she has done, does do. Killed with a hoe the biggest rattlesnake ever seen in this county. Sixteen rattles. Dip snuff secretly. Tame hummingbirds. Just try it till they balance on her finger. Tell ghost stories. We both believe in ghosts. So tingling, they chill you in July. Talk to herself. Take walks in the rain. Grow the prettiest japonicas in town. Know the recipe to every sort of old-time Indian cure, including a magical wart removal. Now, with supper finished, we retire to a room in the faraway part of the house where my friend sleeps in a scrap quilt covered iron bed painted rose pink, her favorite color. Silently, wallowing in the pleasures of conspiracy, we take the bead purse from its secret place and spill its contents on the scrap quilt. Dollar bills, tightly rolled and green as maybuds. Somber 50 cent pieces, heavy enough to weight a dead man's eyes. Lovely dimes, the liveliest coin, the one that really jingles. Nickels and quarters worn smooth as creek pebbles. But mostly, a hateful heap of bitter older pennies. Last summer, others in the house contracted to pay us a penny for every 25 flies we killed. Oh, the carnage of August. The flies that flew to heaven. But it was not work in which we took pride. And as we sit counting pennies, it is as though we were back tabulating dead flies. Neither of us has a head for figures. We count slowly, lose track, start again. According to her calculations, we have $12.73. According to mine, exactly 13 Oh, I do hope you're wrong, buddy. We can't mess around with 13. The cakes will fall. Or oh, put somebody in the cemetery. Why, I wouldn't dream of getting out of bed on the 13th. This is true. She always spends 13th in bed. So, to be on the safe side, we subtract a penny and toss it out the window. Of the ingredients that go in our fruit cakes, whiskey is the most expensive, as well as the hardest to obtain. State law forbids its sale. But everybody knows you can buy a bottle from Mr. Ha Ha Jones. And the next day, having completed our more prosaic shopping, we set out for Ha Ha's business address. A sinful, to quote public opinion, fish fry and dancing cafe down by the river. We've been there before and on the same errand, though in previous years our dealings have been with Ha-Ha's wife, an iodine dark Indian woman with brassy peroxided hair and a dead tired disposition. Actually, we've never laid eyes on her husband, though we've heard he's an Indian too, a giant with razor scars across his cheeks. They call him Ha Ha because he's so gloomy. A man who never laughs. As we approach his cafe, a large log cabin festooned inside and out with chains of garish gay naked light bulbs and standing at the river's muddy edge beneath the shade of river trees where moss drifts through branches like gray mist. Our steps slow down. Even Quinny stops prancing and sticks close by. People have been murdered in Ha Ha's Cafe. 
cut to pieces, hit on the head. There's a case coming up in court next month. Naturally, these goings on take place at night, when the colored lights cast crazy patterns in the Victrola whales. In the daytime, Ha Ha's is shabby and deserted. I knock at the door. Queenie barks. My friend calls out, Mrs. Ha Ha, ma'am? Is anyone to home? footsteps. The door opens. Our hearts overturn. It's Mr. Ha Ha Jones himself. And he is a giant. He does have scars. And he doesn't smile. No, he glowers at us through Satan-tilted eyes and demands to know what you want with Ha Ha. For a moment, we're too paralyzed to tell. Presently, my friend half finds her voice a whispery voice at best. If you please, Mr. Ha Ha, we'd like a quart of your finest whiskey. His eyes tilt even more. Would you believe it? Ha Ha is smiling, laughing even. Which one of you is a drinking man? It's for making fruitcakes, Mr. Ha Ha, cooking. This sobers him. He frowns. That's no way to waste good whiskey. Nevertheless, he retreats into the shadowed cafe and seconds later returns bearing a bottle of daisy yellow unlabeled liquor. He demonstrates its sparkle in the sunlight and says, Two dollars. Oh, we pay him with nickels and dimes and pennies. Suddenly, as he jangles the coins in his hand like a fist full of dice, his face softens. Tell you what, he proposes, pouring the money back into our beat purse. Just send me one of them fruitcakes instead. Well, remarks my friend on the way home, there's a lovely man. We'll put an extra cup of raisins in his cake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. What a wonderful set of uh, collective memories of Christmas and the holidays he brings back. Um, our next, uh, our next folks today bring another set of Christmas memories. We have the Top Deck Quartet. Uh, the Top Deck Barbershop Quartet is made up of tenor Bob Reinecke of Vancouver, Washington, lead Sam Vigil uh, Jr. of Gresham, bass Glenn Russell of Vancouver, and baritone Kevin Beer of Brush Prairie, Washington. Uh, you may wonder about the origin of the quartet's name. Apparently it came up during a barbecue on the upper deck of Bob's floating home where he and his wife were living at the time. So welcome the Top, top Deck Quartet.
barbershop song that I can sing when I am blue. Prune me a tune that will soon take my worries away. Something with rhythm, not too starchy. I get such a thrill. A thrill. Don't give me jazz or polyachi. They don't fit my bill. Give me a beat to start tapping my beat you and you'll see my troubles fly. Don't even stop if a teardrop fills my eye. And there isn't a better way to make my day seem fine than humming and singing a good old Barbershop song, a barbershop song. Give me a song, an old barbershop song that I can sing when I am blue. Croon me a tune that will soon take my worries away. Something with rhythm, not too starchy. I get such a thrill. Don't give me jazz or polyachi. Stop. <clears throat> I love Duke Ellington, but oh, that barbershop. Give me a beat to start tapping my feet to, and you'll see my troubles fly. Don't even stop if a teardrop fills my eyes. Sing in a good old barbershop song. There's no substitute for a barbershop song. Love that song. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We are top deck for tip. We are very very pleased to be here. We are really happy to be here. I understand that uh, the program committee was asked to find a funny and entertaining musical act, and they found that their budget could afford neither. <laughs> they got us. Thank you very much, Susan. We know where you are. Anyhow, uh, a couple of barbershop songs. We'll sing another barbershop song before we get into the, uh, into the holiday music. Uh, the next song we like to sing is about is an old song about getting slowing life down, getting out of the fast lane.
right in the middle of the holiday season, we thought we'd present some, these are about the right height, huh? present some uh, Christmas music for you. But first, we'd like to do a costume change, if we may. very much ladies and gentlemen now we'd like to sing about santa claus coming to town which uh, actually got me thinking if there's a if uh, santa claus has a father wouldn't that make him a grandfather claus oh, oh yeah but but what about santa's helpers subordinate clauses Let's go. 
to sing for you today is probably the most popular Christmas song that's ever been done. But it's one of those songs that you've almost probably not heard the first words to. It's one of those kind of songs that you're listening to thinking, okay, well, this is kind of an okay song. And then we get to the chorus and you say, oh, yeah, I know that song. folks here have children or grandchildren. I suppose that those are related somehow. When, when they first touched a piano, what was the first song that they learned? Ooh, Twinkle Twinkle. Well, that doesn't fit with our set, actually. What was the other one? Chopsticks. See, now this guy got it right. Make sure you take care of him afterwards. Um, cho did you know that Chopsticks is a Christmas song? Uh, you didn't? Let's help you with that. was the night before Christmas and all through the house not a creature was stirring not even a mouse the stockings were hung by the chimney with care in the hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there he's bringing lots of toys for girls and boys and wait until you see that merry Christmas tree so Dancer on Dancer on Prancer on Vixen on Comet on Cupid on Donner and Blitzen to the top of the roof to the top of the wall. He's coming to wish Merry Christmas to Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a lot of fun singing here with you. 
we got another one more Christmas song that we like to uh, sing for you. Um, it's another it's another song that sometimes we don't know who the songwriter is, but we know if we put them together, we go, oh yeah. Uh, some you're familiar with the Velvet Fog. Mel Torme, exactly. And so the Christmas song we'd like to sing for you is probably his best known song. Thank you very much. Uh, we've been glad to share the afternoon with you today. Uh, we'd like to uh, do one more song for you before we leave. Um, however, it's time for the shameless plug. Since I got lots of business cards, we're for hire. We sing around a lot. We like to sing. It's more fun singing for people in chairs than in the empty chairs we sing to when we rehearse. You know. But anyhow, we, we're really glad we could be here this afternoon. Um, the last song we'd like to. Uh, oh yeah, website. I'm sorry. TopDeckQuartet.com, you know, www.TopDeckQuartet.com all together, you know, you'll find us. Or do a Google search for Top Deck Quartet and you'll find us too. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, we've got one last song we'd like to leave with you, a barbershop song, uh, kind of a um, after work party kind of song, you know, if you're having those Christmas parties after work, you know, it kind of goes along with it. When it's darkness on the delta, that's the time my heart is light. When it's darkness on the delta, let me linger in the shelter of the night. Heels of cotton all around me, voices singing sweet and low. Oh, I'm lucky that you found me where the muddy Mississippi waters flow. On the levee, listen to the nightingale. Way up above, laughter on the levee. No one's heart is heavy. All God's children got someone to love. When it's dark, it's on the delta. Only heaven is inside. When it's dark, it's on the delta. Let me linger in the shelter of the night. Yeah.
heavy. All God's children got someone to love. The greatest of kids on the Delta. Steve Wilkerson and the Top Tech Quartet it said it far better than I can, but have a wonderful holiday and a happy new year, and we look forward to seeing you all in January. Thanks. <laughs>